Listener Production. Hey, welcome to the Weekend Briefing, where we talk to the humans behind the headlines. I'm Tom Tilley, and in this episode, Dr. Zach Seidler. He's a psychologist who's on a mission to, it's very simple really, improve men's mental health. And he is in the headlines a bit. You'll see Zach's name in articles um, about toxic masculinity or Andrew Tate, the manosphere, um, also Movember, anything to do with men and their mental health and their place in society. Zach is often part of the conversation and he brings a really deep research basis to that. He is a research fellow at Origin, which is a mental health research treatment and policy organization at Melbourne Uni. And he's also the global director of men's health research at Movember. He also, as you'll hear in this interview, brings a very heartbreaking personal story to his work. And in this interview, we talk about all manner of things, men, um, including the label toxic masculinity. We talk about suicide, depression, and the friendship crisis for men. Zach, welcome to the Weekend Briefing. Thanks for having me, Tom. Awesome to have you here. You're a man on a mission, which is basically improving men's health, to put it very simply. I want to talk about the mission itself, the problems, the solutions, but I also want to know why you are on that mission. Go back to your childhood. Tell us what that was like and whether that, pushed you on this journey in some way. I'm the therapist here, Tom. This is a, this is a strange uh, seat to be in, but I'll, it. I'll deal with it. Um, so going back to my childhood, well, I I think that I was always interested in stories. I, I was curious about why people behave the way that they did. And a really simple thing that kind of always rose to the surface was the difference between men and women. Mm. It was always so interesting to me as a drama kid, as a music kid who was surrounded by women to then go, you know, I considered myself kind of sporty and I would then go into new spaces and places and watch how people interacted with me and how I interacted with them in a totally different way to how I did when I was in drama class. I was free, I was flexible, I was able to be Mm. a different version of myself and then suddenly I'm posturing and I'm competitive and I'm in, in, in totally different rooms, I would be a different person. And so I was like, surely someone else is experiencing this as well. Mm. You're trying to work out who you are, identity yeah. formation is happening. And as I've grown, I've like, oh, I can actually hold both of these in one single body. And that sparked a deep curiosity within you? Yeah. I think looking back, whenever I do a podcast, I'm always like, oh, there's one reason that I do yeah. what I do. But it was multifaceted. My family, you know, has played a huge essential role in, in who I am and how I four. interact. I am one of four. Very loud, obnoxious, <laughs> um, a competitive family, but I, I love it. And they help me, you know, cut my teeth in some of this stuff. But also, um, you know, going to university and, and being surrounded by, I was like one of very few men in a psychology degree. And so I was like, oh, I want to bring the arts and science together. You know, these two worlds again collided. And I was like, oh... As a guy in this space, no one's really talking about men. No one's really reflecting on masculinity. And so I was surrounded by women and and feminism and the idea of how to go about being a good man in this day and age. It kind of felt like no one was actually providing any type of um, code book, any type of guidebook about how to go about this. So I, I started crafting one in my own head and that blew up as I continued in this field into a drive and a passion for a dialogue with men, not about men. So psychology came first and then the mission to focus that on men kicked in as you went through those uni years? Yeah. So I did a gender studies major as well at, at uni right. um, and I was the only straight white male, I think, still to date <laughs> to, have, to have done that. I loved it. I was just surrounded by, you know, lots of queer women, lots of people who were like kind of really pushing me and like, mm-hmm. why are you here? And I was like, oh, I should probably think about that. And then it became clear that I had a, I had a role to play. I had a voice in that There is, you know, people call me an expert. They go, oh, you've got Mm. specialist skills about men's mental health. And I was like, this is not a specialty. (laughs) This is 51% of the population, Mm. 50% of the population. It's not a niche. No, it shouldn't be a niche, (laughs) but the fact that it is is the problem really. So I was like, oh, there's a real space to carve out here. No one's talking about this stuff. So one of the first things you notice in university is that you're one of the only blokes there. Mm. What else did you notice that made you think, okay, we're not dealing with men's mental health properly? 
Yeah. So I would sit in lectures and we'd talk about gender and there was a lot of discussion about, about women because women were the majority of people who show up in psychology practices, yeah? The vast amount of help seeking is with women and the vast majority of clinicians, like over 80%, are women. So I'm like, all right, we're, we're living in a world which is female dominated. The healthcare space is kind of feminized in, in many ways. Within psychology or the whole healthcare space? It, yeah. The mental health space specifically mm -hmm. around, you know, verbal communication and vulnerability and intimacy being core components of mm. good therapy. That's a, a stereotypical, you know, feminine way of, and mm. female way of, of interacting. Many men do shoulder to shoulder while women do face to face. Trying to create that understanding of, wait a second, I'm existing in this world where there is not a really clear narrative for how men should be and act. And they're not coming forward. They're not engaging in care. And whenever we talk about men, we talk about them as the problem. We talk about them as something to be fixed. We talk about their ADHD, their violence, their drug use and, and substance mm. misuse. And we start to overlook with any empathic you know, lenses, what is it that is underpinning their behavior? And so I was just constantly putting up my hand in class being like, wait a second, as, as one of the only male voices in the room, mm. how are we doing this? Women sit over here and have this nuanced, diverse, complex inner world and men are just, you know, monosyllabic monsters in a way. And I was like, I don't buy it. What I wanted to do is shine a light on the fact that behind closed doors, you and I, Tom, are going to talk in totally different ways. There's different going to codes, be great. Exactly. But there's beauty to it. There's, there's the beauty and the beast, really, of masculinity. And we want to find a way to go, whatever you think is happening is your objective lens on something. And we want to provide the subjective. I want to go, there is actually so many different ways that men show up. And I wanted to go to people in, in the class and say, you think that men, for instance, are, they just experience, you know, they've got ADHD, they've got violence, they've got all of these different things that are kind of externalizing, mm. you know, they take it out on the world. And I was like, what do you think is going on internally? Have you taken a moment to just stop and go, what is impelling that young man to act in that way? Was the situation that many of the women that were seeking therapy were needing it because of the results of those behaviours? And so that was the lens within which male behaviour was was viewed within rather than the therapy for the men, you know, and the reasons for that behaviour. For sure. There, there just wasn't a lot of, uh, th there wasn't a lot of silence <laughs> to just take a moment and go, wait a second, this type of behaviour comes from somewhere. It's socialised in certain ways. It is not necessarily what men want to be doing. It's not in line with many of their values, but they continue to do it. And women are bearing the brunt of it. So rather than trying to band-aid solve all of this over and over again with women who are coming in as, as victims and survivors of poor behaviour, men behaving badly, mm. instead maybe we should get to the source of this and go, what are we teaching our boys? How are they going about learning what manhood looks like? Mm. And rather than saying, this is broken, this is toxic, we can instead go, what does life mean for you? What is your purpose? What is your meaning? And this is why so many young men are now leaning into the Petersons, Rogans, mm. Tates of the world who are going, hey, guys, do this. Live like this because the opposite is just this type of everything you touch blows up. You're looking at the industry, seeing problems with it, um, but you have a parallel personal journey that makes this whole space way deeper and, and more painful mm. for you. While you're at university, your father dies, tanks his own life, and it came as a big surprise from what I've heard you say in, in previous interviews. Mm. What happened to him and, and why, why was it a surprise? Yeah, I think that it's a surprise because suicide is always a surprise, really. In the grand scheme of things now that I've treated so many men who are suicidal in my, in my years, there are so many risk factors that we, we never want to see. There are so many things going on that we kind of turn a blind eye to because you never want to believe that this is possible. But he had been experiencing depression for decades, you know, since he was a teenager, since he was at med school himself. He had these dark days, months, weeks where he couldn't leave, you know, his bedroom. And there was no kind of discussion about that. I could never talk to him about it. And it's really something I think that pushed me even further and further into psychology because I was like, 
I need to find ways to connect with men like him who felt failed by the system, who didn't have the words to describe what was going on for him. Whoa, that's so emotional to think of you as a uni student seeing these problems in kind of a distant meta way, not really knowing what was about to pop up for yeah, you. Yeah. And essentially the same problem that you were seeing in that broader societal sense was going on with the person probably most important in your whole life. Exactly. It was just really, it was really frustrating at first because those final months of, of his life, there was a lot of discussion. He believed very strongly in like the medical model. He believed that if he just took certain medications, if if he just pushed on, he didn't need to get to the core of what was happening. He didn't need to discuss what was going on. But I continued to be like, we need to find a way to talk but I just could not get any anywhere with him. And I was a I was a baby doctor then. Yeah. I had no idea. But you were idea. seeing it. You were seeing the need to crack him open. Yeah, yeah, I was. But uh it was so it was really awkward. It was really uncomfortable with him. But you're both believers in the medical system, him him as well. And yeah. the medical system includes the mental health system. It does. It does. But he was a man of a different generation, you know. He had real shame and stigma around this thing. None of his friends knew that he'd ever experienced depression until they showed up at his funeral. There was no understanding of his years of suffering and that was a secret that he always wanted to keep and he made sure. And I remember feeling, there were certain moments where I was like, I need to talk to someone about this. And he always kind of suggested that he did not want this to be a marker of his character or who he was and we're in a totally different time now and I wish that he was here to see all of the progress that we've made as a society in going if you suffer from a mental health issue it doesn't define you if anything it's your superpower in many ways and that depth of feeling was what made him the best doctor in the world. So you're about 10 or 12 years down the track from that now You've learned a lot more. You've grown up as a human being, as a man, as a psychologist, mm. as a communicator. Knowing what you now know, is there a way you could have cut through with your dad? I, I, I reflect on this a lot. If I was in my current state, I think I could have because we, we're, I'm having far more nuanced, in-depth conversations about this stuff that would have rubbed off on him one way or another. I think that the way that society is going, his greatest fear as a doctor was that he would be stripped of his license. And back in the day, that was what would happen. Mm. You know, a decade ago, which is not very long, if a doctor was found to have a mental health issue that was, you know, getting in the way of their practice, they'd be stripped of their license. And, and this, that was his whole identity, you know. And this was a man who was giving his heart and soul to his charitable medical work in mm. King's Cross in Sydney dealing with some of the most troubled people in our society. Exactly. And that's why I think it it really grounded him because it gave him perspective endlessly to work with heroin addicts and sex workers and homeless men. Um, you know, I worked there as a 14, 15-year-old on Saturday mornings wow. and seeing the way that he engaged with others, all of that I think colours my experience now and who I am. You know, I had a very privileged upbringing but he would take me to a place where there was no privilege and I got to see the way that the world worked and the way that he interacted with people. Mm. And that gave me a real respect for and, and, and a lack of fear for anyone. If I walk up to a, a homeless person now, I'm never afraid because my dad would always get down on one knee and have a chat with them. And that's the worldview and that's the, the type of behavior I want to take forward. I, I find that interesting because you're now working in a space trying to break down some of these characteristics of, of Australian men and I would often attribute those those characteristics of of the rigid blokiness that doesn't allow them to be vulnerable and, and work through issues and connect openly. And and also another point to add is that Movember has been very good at connecting with these people just through making it simple, growing mm. a moustache and, and connecting with other blokes. And then through that, reaching out into these other deeper issues they might not normally touch. So I'm interested for you personally, coming into this mission, trying to fix these problems that often are more prevalent and, and more difficult in these other parts of Australian society, how do you connect with that? Mm. So two things there. Firstly, uh, what's awesome about November is that we're in 21 countries. So yeah. I, I get to see masculinity writ large. It's I get huge to see in it. Canada, America yep. and England and yep. then a bunch of New other Zealand, countries. New yeah. Zealand, Ireland, we're all over the shop. We're going to crack India because they love a moustache over there yeah. um, soon enough. But I think 
what you get to see and, and through my five years at the, at the organisation, I've been able to see the similarities and the differences between men. And what has happened is that it's kind of broken open that idea that there is, you know, a, a single way of being. And the fact that a blue collar tradie who lives in, you know, regional Australia is going to have such a different worldview to someone who is living in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. I think that the underlying core constructs of like traditional masculinity of being risk-taking and self-reliant and stoic, they might look different in their behavioural output. They come from the same place. But I believe that we are dealing with a very similar issue, regardless of who the guy is, which is this idea of precarious manhood, which is that everyone is running towards goalposts that continue to move. So regardless of who you are and what type of man you are, unless you've managed to get off the treadmill altogether, and I respect those men, I think they're very few and far between, mm. we are running towards this thing. We're trying to get man cards. We're trying to accrue all of this idea of what it means to be a man, but it gets taken away from you very, very quickly without any sense of control. Mm. All right. That's a really good answer. Um, you finish your degree. You... I didn't bring it. I'm sorry. I didn't bring it with me. But I, 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 trust me. Trust I trust me. I'm wearing, wearing the glasses, so it, it happened. <laughs> you've got, you know, you've yeah, got the language, you've got the words. <laughs> yeah. Um, I imagine there's a period of grieving which may mm. still be going, but at some point you're able to kick back into your work, mm. possibly with renewed enthusiasm and drive. Mm. And then you decide not to just stay in academia. You've basically. You're still doing some academic work, but you're working for Movember full time, running mm. the Movember Men's Health Institute. Mm. Why did you choose that path to make an impact? Yeah, there was there was definitely a, a, a period of grieving, but my grieving is action grieving, mm. which was like um, I'm going to make meaning of this, and I, I've I've reflected a lot about this in my in my own therapy. You know, I've got four Holocaust survivor grandparents, and there was no time to stop for them. And I think it's written in my DNA now, which is like, mm. this is horrible. What just happened was extremely traumatic, but I'm not going to sink. I'm not going to break down here because that's not a legacy for him. That's not a way of, you know, showing my love and respect for everything mm. that he gave me. I'm not going to fall over in a heap and just give up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean into this and I'm going to bloody a, double down. It's a beautiful, powerful resilience that a lot of Holocaust surviving families have. Mm. Mm. It was very much just like... Well, you know, I remember being at dad's funeral, my, my grandma who, who, you know, lost her whole family. Mm. We're walking out of the funeral and she goes, look up, the sky is blue. And I was like, now, right now, <laughs> <laughs> it's been 10 minutes, but, uh, she's just like, we go, we go on, we move on. And mm. so I, I didn't stop. None of us did. What happened from then on was started, uh, you know, did a PhD really focused on on men and masculinity and, and help seeking. Why don't men seek help was mm -hmm. kind of why I started. And it became very clear that men do seek help. And I'd known that my dad had sought help and the system mm -hmm. just didn't connect with him. And so I was like, mm, we need to do something differently. The system has to adapt. The system has to change. And that message really resonated because it doesn't blame anybody. It goes, this is our collective situation mm. as consumers, as practitioners, as people who run, you know, policy around this stuff. So I didn't want to do ivory tower bullshit academia. It doesn't interest me. I don't want to do science for the sake of science that no one hears about and collects dust. Mm. I wanted to do really high impact, rigorous work, but I needed to make sure that it had practical implications and existed in the real world. That is all Movember wants to do. You know, we're, we're an NGO that started with a funny, humorous idea. It just seemed like a gimmick and we've raised over a billion dollars hmm. over 20 years, wow. you know, and now everyone is trying to do something with chest, body or, you know, <laughs> facial hair one way or another. That's too much hair. Yeah, yeah, everyone needs to just relax. I only took the job because I can grow a moustache in three <laughs> minutes. Um, but it's a mission that I just like fully align with, which is like having fun, doing good. So you made the choice not to be the best researcher, mm. but to be the best interface between that researcher and the men that need it and the system that surrounds them? I don't know about the best, but I, I'm, I'm attempting to do it, which is like, I want to bridge that gap. I want to go... Uh, research into practice. I want to bring clinical work into practice. I want to make sure that men out there feel seen and heard and that we are getting their, their rich lived experience and bringing it to the fore rather than talking at them, we're talking with them.
What have you learned? What is the most important research saying about the problem men are facing today? Mm. Well, there are base numbers, which is that we're losing seven men a day to suicide in this country. Yeah, and if you look across the globe, that's a man a minute. And what we find with that is that for each man that dies by suicide, 135 people on average are directly impacted by that. That's what, you know, it's called the ripple effect, but I think it's a tsunami, really. Mm. That's why everyone listening is going to have felt this and heard of someone who has taken their life mm. and be affected by it. But what the research really tells me and the thing that kind of gets me up in the morning is that firstly, the health system, the formal health system is not the panacea here. We need social connection. We need informal support. We need friends and family and colleagues to know how to talk to men in the light of day. Mm. This is not a dark corner conversation about mental health. We need to be doing this constantly in ways that m make sense for guys. And so believing that it is, you know, something that can actually be taught, I think is really important. We can teach young men how to connect with one another and it doesn't need to be in this type of emotional sappy way either. Mm. They can do it in an action-oriented, goal-focused way. What do you need from me? How can I help? What can I do to, to lift you up? The problem is, is that the majority of guys out there are losing friends faster than we would like. Mm. They do not prioritize it. They don't connect. And that's what Movember is all about. If you look at any longitudinal survey, if you look at the Harvard Longitude Happiness mm. Survey, yeah, it's not, it's not obesity. It's not smoking. These aren't the things that, that lead to life expectancy, you know, gaps any more than the amount of quality relationships that you have. That is a thing that is going to keep you kicking. Mm. And so- there's a reason that, that men are dying far earlier than women. The life expectancy gap is huge, you know. It's four to six years depending on, on what country you're in. And we need to find a way that men feel that they are, you know, valued but also that they have a place. And at the moment I don't think that we have um, a society that is finding room for how men can play a really useful role for themselves yeah, that's an interesting point. I wonder if you ever get any backlash for being so focused on helping men when there's such a widespread belief that it's building up women that needs the most focus right at this point in history. For sure. Depending on the room that I, I walk into, someone's pissed off. You know, right. it's why are you working on men or it's why are you not doing more for men? <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter who it is. And that mm. kind of talks to our political state at the moment. Because there's but, some pretty tarnished sort of movements within this space oh, that yeah. I imagine you probably share some beliefs with, you know, the men's rights activist movement has a, has a shocking name for its mm. attitudes and in some cases misogyny. Um, so how do you navigate that? That was, that happened really early in my PhD. I remember being like, what do I stand? I need to sit down. I sat down with my supervisors. I'm like, this could go wrong very quickly. And I was on Twitter a lot and I was like, oh, I, I like what he said. I like what he said. And then you go and you read his feed and you're like, oh, shit, I do not like what not he that said. Bit, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. So I don't want to be a, um, a chameleon, but I want to be able to, to exist in all of those spaces. And that's what Movember wants to do. We want to stay bipartisan in, ma in many ways. And what we want to do is have a conversation where you realize that men's health is a whole of societal issue. The failings of not only the health system, but society in responding to men's needs is really harming women and children. Mm. And so we always say, and this is something that I believe to my core, healthy men, healthy world. Mm. If you fix the middle-aged white men in this society, if you can get to the bottom of violence prevention through a male lens, if you can look at male suicide through men's experiences, we will save a lot of pain and suffering for those who are surrounding, caring, living, loving men. Mm. Okay. So you're talking about the suicide rate there and men are vastly overrepresented, but essentially that's that's the result. The the actual problems that, that get us there, um, I imagine, are much more complex. Two things that are coming up for me here are social connection and men's friendships. The other are, is the broader societal conversations about having about men and their behavior, you know, the idea of toxic masculinity. Let's start with the first one, social connection. Your research has found some pretty shocking statistics mm. on men's friendship and how what a poor state it's in. Yeah. You know, you always look at your mates and you're like, wait a second, 
we all connect with one another every once mm. in a while. What what could possibly be going wrong out there? When you survey thousands of guys, especially when they get into their their thirties and up, you start to see this complete caving of of male friendship. And the reason for that is is this socialized belief that they need to be a protector and a provider that kind of kicks in. And so as they start to age and if they happen to have a family, they move into this role of trying to just control the things within their life. And those connections start to become deprioritized. They're not important to them. They can't actually quantify the impact that it's having on them. And so they go, oh, I don't need that. But when they do see their friends, and I have this with a couple of my mates, I see them every once in a while and they're like, oh, damn, that was so good. I'm like, mm. call me, mate. Call me then. Yeah. Remember this. I live 10 minutes away. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But yeah. Um, what we tend to find is that, you know, it's like over 40% of guys had one or no support person that they could connect with what? in a time of need. You know, they talk about the male friendship crisis in the States, but it is happening in this country. There is no doubt about it. The suicide rate is rising at a terrifying rate in the 40 to 60 year old age bracket. It's those middle-aged men who are going, where do I belong? Who am I? What is my authentic self? I don't have anyone to talk to about this stuff because my wife creates all of the social engagements for me. I don't prioritize it. I don't pick up the phone and go, do you want to go for a walk? That just doesn't happen. And that needs to be the norm. Why don't guys do that? Why don't they drive, you know, some do by the mm, way, but of course. I, I'm, I make a big effort to personally, but a lot don't. And they just have this, there's this moment of hesitation mm. when they want to reach out. What is that? I am personally relentless about this. Mm. And the reason I am is because I... I don't only value it, I think that it is, I'm aware of how essential it is to my mm. own well-being, but I also see the benefits for my friends and so I've taken on that role. If I wasn't to do that, I think that there would be a silence on my WhatsApp groups. There's often one or two people within a big friendship circle that initiate a mm. lot of the social connection. The reason that they don't uh, and what we find in the research is that leaning in to a friendship requires vulnerability. It requires me saying, I need you. And that is at complete odds with the self-reliant, stoic idea of what it means to be a man. And so we can continue to say, oh, we're making waves, we're making progress when it comes to some of this stuff. But really, it's in those nuanced relational spaces where guys need to actually go, wait a second, what is stopping me from sending this text saying, hey, mate, I'd love to have dinner tomorrow night. Mm. And when you get down into it, what you find is I don't want to admit that I need him, but I really hate the idea of like bromance, you know? What, why do we need... Like it's exotic. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's create this hilarious term for something that's just a gimmick because every once in a while, oh, I'm going to... Like what about like deep-seated bloody love between friends yeah. that I don't need to get pissed in order to tell him how I feel about it. That's where I want to get to. Well, that's just one of the unhealthy elements of masculinity about the fear of being seen to be gay. Exactly. Well, it's you know, masculinity is literally defined by what it is not. <laughs> yeah. It's anti-femininity and it's anti-homosexuality. Yeah. Masculinity and is it's don't, the most be, unhealthy, yeah. don't be a woman and don't be gay. Mm. It's, it's not what you should do. It's just don't do these things and you'll be okay. But that is like so constraining because mm. both of those stereotypical ways of being as a gay or bi man or as a woman lean into connection, vulnerability and, and you know, intimacy. And mm -hmm. that's what we need moving forward. So that touches on the other thing I wanted to talk about, which is the, the meta narratives about masculinity. And so, you know, let's talk about it. The phrase toxic masculinity is often well-meaning trying to describe those limitations on masculinity that make it unhealthy, that, that lead to blockages in social connection and reaching out for help and the important things that make you mentally healthy. But the phrase itself seems to have become quite damaging. Oh, yeah. I had a really good debate with Chanel Contos about this. Okay. Um, if you want to invite her into the room, <laughs> we, can, we can do it live. Um, and I totally understand hers and others belief that it is a useful term to try to get to the bottom of what is going on on the ground. My response is, is this helping? Yeah, I come from a perspective of we need to get guys to do something and the best way 
to ensure they do nothing is to lecture them, to shame them and to blame them. Mm. That is what the term toxic masculinity does. It comes from a media background. It doesn't come from scientific literature. Mm. We've never used it before. Right. And it is very clearly what young men are telling us is when you talk about masculinity now, they say, oh, you mean the silent toxic in front of masculinity. And what that does is mm. it goes, everything you do in the name of men and masculinities is harmful. That is not how we see masculinity though. It is, there's a spectrum there's so many different ways of being. And what you're doing is you're shutting down the conversation mm. and you're saying, hey, guys, actually, you're a 14-year-old boy. The way that you engage as a man with women or others, it's toxic. It's broken and there's no way out. Mm. What it does is it goes, this is the thing that you've been handed. Here's your, here are your cards and you will just have to deal with that rather than saying, hey, toxic ways of being are a very prominent form of masculinity. They exist. There's no denying them, but there are other choices here. And so rather than saying toxic masculinity is all there is, we say, here are healthy masculinities. Here are flexible masculinities. Here are ways of connecting with the world that are going to be helpful rather than harmful. And we open up the options rather than saying, this is who you are. This is what's wrong with you. It doesn't allow for any intervention. So what's know? the right label? So, so I, I think it needs to be a word that implies that some things are going too far yeah. to an unhealthy stage rather than being completely flawed. So what is the label? Great. Here we go. Let me just throw another word into the mix to be become a part of the problem. I think that uh, <laughs> what, what we should be looking at is, yeah, what are harmful behaviours that are aligned with masculinity? I don't think you should be putting an adjective in front of masculinity. So it's not just toxic that's the problem in that phrase. It's no. masculinity as well. It's, oh, yeah. It's putting them together. Because that makes it about the person and their masculinity, not the behaviour. It's a descriptor for a gender role, which is not something that they created. It was something that is handed to them in, in complex ways. So here's the catchy phrase. Harmful behaviours... Sometimes carried out by men. <laughs> <laughs> That'll sell. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. That's why you're in marketing. <laughs> <laughs> is that does, is that right? That's a terrible. That will not tank off. It's not catchy. Um, but is that it? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it is. It's like when are you doing things that are firstly not in line with your values, and secondly going to harm yourself and others. And it just so happens that men are far more likely to enact to those, those behaviors. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm glad we, we sorted it. that we out. We did it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the other big meta narrative is around male influences, mm. and so Andrew Tate is now the most famous. You're going to tell me uh, it's so passe, and there's so other, passe. there's there's other <laughs> terrible men out there saying yeah, terrible yeah. things, yeah. but uh, they're getting traction. The difficulty is, and I think the detractors, the critics struggle to do this to their own detriment is to acknowledge that some of the messages from these people who have very unhealthy messages, some of their messages are healthy. Mm, exactly. Once again, casting a very broad brush over all of this content is the problem here. If you continue to go to young men, hey guys, billions of you are watching this content, you're all idiots. That's a really good way to engage with young men. <laughs> Rather, you walk into the room, you go, hey, guys, what are you getting from this? What benefit are you, mm. you know? If you look at David Goggins, for instance, who everyone loves, yeah, he doesn't have any misogynistic stuff. He's, a, you know, an ex-Marine. He's really, really full on. He is, you know, largely a discipline influencer. So he's a good role model? That's up for debate. And this is where okay. this kind of comes in. There is there is black and white here. There's a lot of him saying, get out of bed, push yourself, find your purpose, find your meaning, don't take no for an answer. And then it starts to get into, you're a little bitch. Why don't you, you know, you're so weak. And it and it's like, all right, you're, now you're reinforcing some of these masculine traits. And when we talk with young guys, they always say to us, with Andrew Tate specifically, I love his financial stuff. I love hearing about how he has pushed himself to the limit and found a way to be the best version of himself, which, you know, I've, I've watched, you don't want to see my uh, algorithm. It's terrifying. <laughs> my partner's like, oh, you've gone to the dark side. But there's a lot of stuff in there that I'd be like, hell yeah. Yeah. I'm into this. This aligns with my positive masculinity, the, the, the version of myself that I want to create. What these young men say is they go, oh, yeah, and I just leave the misogyny and homophobia and sexism and racism at the door. And I'm like, how, if you're watching two and a half hours of this on average a day on TikTok, are you just leaving that 
behind and they go, oh, I have these, you know, you get a 15 year old guy. He's like, I've, I've got critical analysis skills. Hmm. And it's like, I don't think that we're aware of the impact of this behavior. So I think my main outcome here of interest is around getting past an alarmist narrative that everything is harmful and everyone is suffering and how dare these guys speak to our young men and rather go, why are they seeking out these narratives? What role is it playing in their lives? And how can we enhance their ability to connect with this content and seek out new voices rather than saying, you're wrong, you're broken? Because every time we do that, they go, all right, I'm going to watch more of him. If you're in your position trying to, I guess, reduce the harmful influences Mm. or the harmful influence within an, an influencer, how do you do it? We, thankfully, at Movember have a great mechanism here, which is that we go to influencers who seem to have goodness in their approach, but they've got a huge audience of young men and we go, hey, can we work with you? Can we find ways to actually teach you about our work, to teach you about what what we do? Someone edgy? Someone actually dangerous? No, they're actually edgy. They're definitely not as edgy as Tate because that is just way too much reputational damage. But they're, they've got millions of, of young men that they talk to and we go, hey, can you like thread in some mental health stuff? Can Because men's health, mental health stuff is not, you know, Andrew Tate loves and as does Elon Musk the other day, he was like, I, you know, put on my gravestone, never went to therapy. And I was like, mm. we know, don't worry, <laughs> <laughs> it's clear. But like the majority of, of young guys now, even many of these influencers, they know that the mental health narrative, the anxiety narrative mm. kind of gets young men going. So we just need to find a way to connect with those guys and kind of upskill them so that they can, and we don't change their content. We just go, here is some stuff that maybe you can thread through. But are these guys really saying, oh, thanks for the phone call, Movember. I'll come and sit down and be lectured by you. They come and we do co-creation. That's really what it what right. it comes down to. We haven't gone as far into the risky, edgy side that I'd like to, and hopefully moving forward we're going to be able to do that. But we co-fund them. We find ways to actually analyse the data and evaluate their impact as well. Like, we, we take this very seriously. I've just, I can't get the image of you going to Transylvania or whether, <laughs> wherever Andrew Tate's hold Prison. up, waiting for his court case, yeah. standing outside the door and ringing the doorbell, him asking you to bring a box of chocolates or is that how it works? It's really sweet. We hug and it goes really well. (laughs) What do you want to see in the next five years change? What will be the the real focus? What I really want to work on is something called the perception gap, which is there is a really clear gap between the way that men see themselves and their values and the way that they think society views men and masculinity. So when you ask a young guy, hey, do you think that being a gay guy means you're less of a man? A vast minority of them are going to say, yeah, I agree with that. But then when you ask them, hey, what do you think society says about this when it comes to men? You see a massive gap where you've got like 13, 14% of them going, this is what society tells me. This is where you get the locker room mentality, where you get a group of guys sitting around, someone says a misogynistic or homophobic joke, and no one in the room says anything, but nine out of 10 of them are like, oh, I'm not okay with this. I'm not comfortable with it. Pack mentality, pack what, behavior. Because they're terrified of ostracism. Yeah. They're terrified of not belonging. What I want to do is get young guys to understand that there is great belonging in knowing that your internal values are probably very similar to the man next to you. And if we just break that silence, you can work out that what society is telling you is actually bullshit and your belief system about who you are and what you believe in is that's the key that's the thing that is going to get you moving forward and succeeding in life amazing great to speak to you zach thanks so much for sharing your personal story and i guess a lot of these ideas are informed by research so your insights there are so valuable as well thanks for your time thanks tom That was Dr. Zach Seidler, Global Director of Men's Health Research at Movember. And as you heard there, a man on a very important mission, um, really interesting conversation, very emotional and dealing with mental health as well. If it brought up issues for you and you want someone to talk to right now, you can call Lifeline on 13 11 14. That's 13 11 14. 
Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed it, please rate and review us in the app that you're listening to us from. That would be fantastic. And if you haven't subscribed yet to The Briefing, please do so. Look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Listener.